Good to have you with us. This is Bills by the Numbers, where we let the stats tell you where the Bills are at. We're presented by FanDuel. Make every moment more. It has happened very quietly this season, but Buffalo's offensive line might be the best version we've seen in the Sean McDermott era. Just how well are they performing? We break it down for you. We talk Bills Chiefs with former Chiefs offensive lineman Joe Valerio, and Steve is guessing Bills Chiefs history in the numbers game. Is it back to Arrowhead again? Thanks for tuning in. Bills Wall of Famer Steve Tasker, Bills Insider Chris Brown with you. And my goodness, the Bills could set up a residency tour in Kansas City with how many times they've been out there. It's been a season that has not gone the way many expected for the Bills as they sit at the 500 mark after 12 games at 6-6. Six and six. Some areas of the team have not met expectations and others have met or perhaps even exceeded them. One of those areas that has done very well is Buffalo's offensive line. ESPN Stats and Info has Buffalo at 7th in the league in pass block win rate, 63%, and ninth in the league in run block win rate, 72%. Only three other teams in the league have top 10 rankings in both of those metrics. Last year, the Bills finished 4th and 22nd in those categories. So pass block win rate has essentially been top 10 worthy the past two seasons, but the run block win rate ranks much higher this season. How much, Steve, do you attribute that to the two new guards in the starting lineup in Connor McGovern and Osiris Torrance? Well, they're the new pe- they're the new pieces and have made a difference. We thought last year that the Bills were a little bit too um, unable to get any push up down inside. And you know, in the NFL, defensive tackles are big dudes that are strong and they're hard to move you need some big bodies in there McGovern and Osiris Torrance uh, those additions match that and along with Mitch Morris and his savvy down inside they've been able to get a little more push plus I think this year they're doing some stuff in the run game they did not do last year Deion Dawkins is pulling from one side of the formation to the other they're using Spencer Brown in the same exact way although not as often as as uh, Deion the tackles are getting involved in the run game by pulling across the formation. They're doing some different stuff schematically, and that has helped as well. So, uh, yes, it has been the guards, but it's also been a little bit of uh, Ken Dorsey, Joe Brady, using those guys in a little bit different manner as well and getting the tackles yeah. more involved. And we'll get to the tackles in just a little bit, but I think from guard to guard they are noticeably better, noticeably more consistent. And Osiris Torrance, I think, is, has kind of steadily gotten better each week. He hasn't been perfect. Uh, Certainly not in the first six to eight games. You know, he'd have a snap here or there that wouldn't be great. But he's going against some of the best in the league every single week, especially with the strength of schedule that the Bills are playing. And just to see the way those two have teamed up with Morse on the inside has been nothing short of encouraging. And I think they're really hitting their stride now down the backstretch of the schedule. The pass protection has been consistent this season. Not only does Buffalo have the lowest sack percentage in the league, they also have allowed the sixth lowest pressure percentage this season. Opposing pass rushers generate pressure less than 17% of the time. In fact, the Bills have surrendered more than one sack in a game just once in their last eight outings, and that was in a win against Tampa Bay. The design of the pass game does bear some responsibility for that, but Josh Allen has enjoyed the fourth longest time in the pocket on average this season, thanks to that protection at 2.4 seconds per dropback. Might not sound like much time, but the highest in the league is only 2.7. It's made a difference. Absolutely. And the scheme does play a part in it. I think Josh Allen plays as big a part as the five guys up front as well. He's hard to tackle. He's a big dude. He's got mobility, and he's got a great feel for the – for the pocket. He's a veteran quarterback who has learned to throw it away once in a while as well as use his legs. Uh, So yes, the five guys up front don't let any pressure through, and when they do, they still don't give up a sack uh, because of Josh. So he's a hard guy to sack. It puts an extreme amount of pressure on the secondary, the the opponents they're playing, and it is one of the reasons there why you feel like it's a simmering, uh, you know, a juggernaut ready to score on every play because Josh, ne- the ball's never dead and it's never, you know, you never feel like they're out of a play. Uh, all that mixed in makes this, you know, at least statistically in that re- sense, an easy offense to throw from. Yeah, and I would say if there's one thing that I've noticed this year that we didn't see as much of last year, 
It's the integrity of the pocket. Yeah. And it's allowed Josh to hang in there an extra half second at times instead of being so apt to take off and run to extend a play. I think he's, he's built a, a level of faith in the pocket integrity being maintained. And what we've seen, I think, more this year than maybe any other year with Josh at quarterback is him having the confidence to step up into the pocket late in the down and still deliver the football without fear of getting his legs caved in from the side or somebody coming right up in his face. Right. We've seen more opportunities for him to step up in the pocket and deliver the football rather than you know retreating out to one side or the other, as we've seen you know in recent years. Deion Dawkins, as Steve mentioned, is having an all-pro level season again and has killed it on those pulling plays to the opposite side of the formation that Steve referenced. What have you liked the most about his game this season? Well, he's always been – I mean, he's always had that athleticism and the, and the ability to play left tackle in the NFL, which kind of makes you a special dude. But I think this year, more than anything, it's his consistency uh, and his larger role in the run game. Uh, using him to come across the formation, plus his ability to just drop back and handle guys one-on-one in the passing in the pass pro has been stellar. So I, he just never seems to take a play off. Uh, and you know, young guys during the you know their early part of their career sometimes will have a little bit of a roller coaster when they'll yeah. see some things they haven't seen or something will catch their eye and they'll wonder if they've been had and they'll forget about what they're supposed to be doing kind of thing. Um, the mental aspect of switching off with the guard uh, and and still having your eye on the guy outside is you know is, is hard. I just don't think Dion has had very many bad snaps this year, and I think that's as important as anything. Yeah, for me, it's it's his ability to handle the one-on-one pass game assignments sure. this year. They haven't given him a ton of help much right. at all this year, like maybe a chip here or there, but for the most part, it's like, Dion, just take care of that guy over there. We'll focus on everything else. Yeah. And that is a luxury for teams to have on the offensive side of the ball. We can just let your left tackle go to work in a one-on-one situation. And I think to this point, through 12 games, he's only given up one sack this season. I mean, he has been exemplary in pass protection but the favorite part of his game for me is just watching him clean people out of a hole like just obliterate people and just completely clean them out of the play like guy airborne like that kind of stuff when he starts laying the wood to people oh my gosh he's fixed the hair on the back of my neck stand up he's playing to the echo of the whistle as well so he's you know he's finishing guys off in the run game um and it, and, you know, guys notice that, um, and it also start the defense starts to notice it as well, which gives you some added benefit, you know, kind of momentum wise. Mm-hmm. So it's it's nice to to be able to get physical and have a an offensive line that really is difficult to take advantage of, and in in some cases not be dominated by. Yeah, and maybe the most pleasant surprise is Spencer Brown. Heavily criticized by fans the past year or so, he might be having the best year in a Bills uniform. What do you feel has been the biggest reason for the spike in quality and consistency of play here, Steve? I I don't want to oversimplify it, but he's been healthy. Um, no high ankle sprains, no back problems. Um, he had a after his rookie season, he had to have minor back surgery, which is never a good thing. And then he had a high ankle sprain early in the season. He dragged that around for a while, and then he, you know, and then you know, he, so he couldn't have a training camp. You know, pra- all this stuff was it, it couldn't have happened at a worse timing for him. Mm-hmm. Now, completely healthy, has a really solid young guard next to him. Um, all of that stuff has just raised every aspect of his game. Uh, his consistency is better, and he's in there. Uh, and even he, they have used him the opposite way they have used Dion. I mean, opposite direction, where he'll pull from the right all the way across to the left. Um, so they're athlete, he, They're using his athleticism as well. So I think the fact that all five guys across there are at a little bit of higher level, starting with the two guards, has allowed guys like Brown, Mitch Morse, and Spence, and and Dion to just play more consistently. Yeah. And yeah, I think Spencer Brown. Uh, for after all of that, I still think his health has been the biggest attribute to his consistency this year. I know we've talked about it in the offseason on our daily show, One Bills Live, in leading up to Brown's third season. This is a pattern that we've seen with the Bills and their player development. There's less practice time in the offseason. There's less padded practices now under the new CBA. And so players that used to make that jump from year one to year two 
and become true professionals with consistency and quality of play, it seems to take another year now. This is year three for Spencer Brown. We saw Dawson Knox take a big leap in year three. Taron Johnson take a big leap in year three. I think we're seeing that from Spencer Brown here in year three. Make that leap right. with consistency and quality of play. One of the things, too, is they come in, you come in, if you got drafted in 2020, everything was different. Right. And he's and, 21 draft class, but there right. were still restrictions then. Still, and plus with the added problems that he had not being able to go in the offseason and the right. training camp, yeah, it pushed him back a half a year or three quarters of a year. And now you're starting to see what they thought they could get when they drafted him. And I, and I, think, I think most people would say, yeah, okay, now I see it. And – and it's good, and it is good for him. Those linemen have also been instrumental in a spike in the rushing attack. Over the last three games, the Bills are averaging 165 yards a game on the ground. They're 495 yards over the last three games, ranked second most in the entire league behind only Pittsburgh. They lead the league in rushing first downs over that stretch and are third in rushing third down conversions. We saw some of those tendency breakers in the Philadelphia game, Steve, where they ran more on third and short and sometimes even third and medium. How much does that speak to them winning at the line of scrimmage on a consistent basis? That's all basis? it is. I mean, you can't, you can't do it without winning the, yeah. the five guys up front. Certainly the running backs take a lot of credit as well because they're running hard. I think uh, Ty Johnson and certainly Latavius Murray have added a little physicality uh, to the running game. But James Cook has also, I think we've seen him expand his – repertoire into between the tackles yeah uh not just a bounce out guy all the time uh, not just a broken field runner but finding some seams in some pretty tight spaces up inside on short yardage runs so all three of those running backs deserve a little credit but man oh man the offensive it is completely different than what we've seen in the last last year and the year before this offensive line is winning much more consistently up front and they, and you see it in those numbers yeah you think there's just no a, other way to put it you think that just a couple of years ago Third and three, there was no way, right? No way anyone would even consider that the Bills might run on that. Unless, unless it was, unless a, it was a Josh Allen quarterback that's right. draw. That's right. That's it. Like that's there's right. no way they're turning around and handing it to a running back. And now it's something that opposing defenses have to think about in those and, down and distance situations. And it makes them that, more versatile. Not on, not for nothing. It also seems like they're willing to on a third and short or a third and. and pretty short to line up under center and that's a big difference yeah. we're seeing more under center and i think it's a trend around the league too but we're seeing a lot more under center snaps from this offense and there's no way that happens without a really quality offensive line win and so um all of the signs point to how good the five guys up front are playing right and can and Converting those third downs and sustaining those drives has led to a noticeable uptick in time of possession. Almost 37 minutes against the Jets, over 40 minutes against the Eagles. How critical could that be knowing Buffalo's defense is still playing shorthanded? Yeah, they, I think they really do ask a lot of the offense. Um, I, I think they would, I, I, in, it, with their defense playing the way it is, I think that it's a concerted effort just to stay on the field. First downs have become the you know, currency this year, uh, converting them any way, shape, or form. They were the best in the league last year, yeah. and, and they're really good this year as well. Um, and I think that is as big a th – I, I, think, I think teams know they got to do certain things because the Bills are quarterbacked by Josh Allen. they got to do certain things in certain situations. they got to have somebody on him to tackle him and him him. Their pass rush can't start doing all these wild, tra crazy stunts up front – because he steps through the gaps that that leaves, and you're vulnerable. Um, I think no question that this is an offense that has evolved to a point where they feel comfortable letting them control the game. Yeah. And staying on the field, giving their defense, you know, field position okay, but really giving their defense a chance to take fewer snaps in a game than they've been able to in the past. Right. I, I think what I like about it is they know they're going to see too high shell right. almost every single game from opposing defenses. Maybe that changes this week with a Chiefs team that likes to play man. Maybe it changes. But for the most part, it has not. And so instead of the Bills saying, look, Josh has got to make 12 to 14 good decisions before we stick it in the end zone – Having the ability to run the ball the way they have, especially these last three weeks, I think gives Joe Brady the option to say, 
all right, we can go 12 plays. We're going to hand it off four or five, though, you know, on a 12, 13 play drive to keep the defense honest, number one. And that's not a throwaway play anymore. We can get productive yards and stay on schedule because our run game is good enough because the guys up front can win at the line of scrimmage. It's made a huge difference in the diversity of Buffalo's attack. Well, we hope to see that play continue, knowing how consistency they'll need to stack some wins down the stretch. We turn our focus now to the next game on the schedule, and it's a familiar one. Bills at Chiefs. Buffalo found a way to win their last season with a late touchdown from Dawson Knox, game-sealing interception from Taron Johnson, but the Chiefs are a much different team this season. And joining us to lay it all out for us is Believe in Chiefs podcast host and former Kansas City offensive lineman Joe Valerio. All right, Joe, so let's begin here. The Chiefs are a team that has been known for their offense, 30 points a game, coming back in games to win. It's a much different formula this year for them, or at least it has appeared that way on the outside looking in. Would you say, would you go as far as saying that the defense is now the strongest unit on this football team? Yeah, I, I think that's a captain obvious statement, Chris. You know, they're they're absolutely the strength of this team and keeping them in games. Look, you know, the offense has a lot under the hood, and I think Matt Nagy and Andy Reid are just trying to figure out the chemistry of this sort of wide receiving core that's not, you know, look, with no not being critical, they're they're a B to B plus receiving core, right? When you look at each player, they don't have a Calvin Ridley, they don't have a Tyreek Hill, they don't have an AJ Brown, right? They don't have a Stephon Dick. So they're trying to figure out how to best use this receiving core and mix in a, a running game that's been a little bit of a it had a little surge in the running game with Isaiah Pacheco so you put all that together and it's actually you think it would be a great thing to have the running game going but they've always been an offense that didn't really rely on that and they just haven't found that number one receiver to start drawing coverage away from yeah it's interesting because their their points are down last year they scored more than 40 points three times in the season they have yet they've scored 30 only three times this season so yeah. they're their scoring is way down are they consciously making an effort to play offense in a different way or is it just a function of listen we we don't have the guys I think well I think it's a combination Steve I think you know they're, they're trying to use Isaiah Pacheco more to, to keep the offense out on the field right because they always know that that's what they've had to do but now with this surging defense that, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing to get off the field, like, and start throwing the ball more. And, and, you know, I, I, in my personal opinion, look, I was a wide receiver, right. As a lineman, I was not a, I was not, a, I was not a receiver. So who am I to talk? But I just feel like they got to go with Rasheed Rice. Like they, they've got to just make him the number one, right. Target like P- Patrick's passing rating when they, when he throws the ball to him is, is astronomical. Just, Go with them. Like, just use them. They're not using them in the red zone. Just make him your number one. That opens things up for Travis. It opens everything up for the other receivers if they can start to draw, you know, more bracketed and double coverage and things. And and I think they just need to go with it. Stop, you know, pandering around here with trying to figure out who, who this receiving core is going to be. Just go with Rasheed Rice. Go with Travis Kelsey. Use Pacheco when they need him. And define yourselves. They're an undefined de- offense right now. As good as their defense has been, Joe, there are some injury concerns in yeah. the back seven. We saw what happened with Brian Cook last week. Fortunately, he didn't break his ankle, but he's probably a question mark coming into this week. Justin Reed leaves the game, comes back, and then middle linebacker, whether Bolton is ready to come back from wrist surgery is up in the air, and last week, you know, he's, Drew Tranquil's got to go into concussion protocol Jack Cochran's got to come in and fill in for him. What what could we be looking at there, and how big a drop off are we talking about here? I, I think it's a huge drop off, and I think you saw it from the Packers. I mean, you know, no offense to the Packers, but their run game was anemic going into that game, and you would have thought that they had Walter Payton back there. Um, you know, AJ Dillon's a fantastic player, but like you know, you would have thought that they were the Packers were like a running team the way they were running the ball. And I think it's absolutely affected, uh, you know, the way that they've been able to stop the run. Drew Tranquil, I think, was one of the best pickups in the offseason of any team, um, not just for the Chiefs, but – and then to lose that depth there, uh, you know – and then, look, Jack Cocker did a very admirable job, but how many reps did he probably get or how many has he gotten during the weeks? So he's, you know, he's probably still getting his sea legs under him. You know, the injuries, this is the time of the year, right? And this is where offensive coordinators learn to take advantage of all that. And then I was, I will expect that's what the Bills will do. And, of course, they're going to, you know, make Josh Allen a threat. And, 
you know, see what they can do. It's always been a great matchup, and I'm really looking forward to it. How much has, how much do you think these injuries in the current week, because right, it's a week-to-week -week league, how much are these injuries going to affect what Spagnolo can do defensively? Will he, will he force them into more zone? Will it force them into more man? What, do you, what are your thoughts on how these injuries will affect Spagnolo's ability to coordinate the defense? Yeah, that's a great point, Steve. I, I think what it's it's going to affect is is the receipt, you know, the, the linebacking core being able to cover, right? You know that that has been probably a strength of this defense is the ability for those uh, linebackers to really be argonauts. I mean, you know, Willie Gay, Leo Chanel, I mean, Drew Tranquil, you know, when Bolton was healthy, I mean, they're just as good against the pass as they are against the run. So they were they've been able to stop that intermediate passing game by getting quick drops after you know, after the play action, right? A lot of teams try to play action them, get them, pull them up and, and see if they can get them all to bite. But they're beyond that point. You know, this linebacking core is beyond that that youth point, uh, other than Jack Cochran, of course. But the other guys are all experienced now and the play action ha hasn't really been that effective. And I think that's been a feather in Steve Spagnuolo's hat as far as what he has in the playbook and what he can dial up. And I think, you know, when he had all of the defense humming in the beginning of the season when there was health, he could do every, you know, he could do everything. I mean, he could, he could throw the kitchen sink at you and, and put straight man. He could put two deep. You know, a lot of times he'll use the two deep man underneath because he's got these athletic linebackers who can cover running backs out, but they're also just as good against the run. Yeah, it's gonna, it's definitely gonna be a, a mystery uh, to see what he tries to dial up with trying to fill some gaps and fill some holes with some of the injuries. Luckily for the Chiefs, they're still pretty darn healthy up front and they can still rotate. Uh, those guys on, on the, the defensive line because they don't have a whole lot of depth other than Amenahu. who, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of rotation that goes on in there. Those guys play Derek Nottie and, and Jones inside and Karloftis and, and Dana with Omena who kind of rotating in. Those guys get the majority of snaps. So, you know, I'm sure the Bills are going to try to look to tire those guys out, take advantage of, uh, of, the, of their lack of depth on the D-line. They're healthy, but there's not a lot of depth in rotation. Yeah, but at the same time, Joe, those guys have been productive, you know, in the sack department. I mean, Karloftis, Jones, and Dana are all, they all got some big crooked numbers in the sack column. Has that made them more difficult to protect against by opponents? You know, offensive lines can't just slide protection one way when you have that kind of production across the board, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, George Karloftis has really come into his own. It was a great pickup late in the first round. And you know, I know people were probably questioning whether they were getting, you know, a pressure guy or whether they were going to get somebody who could actually sack. And Derek Nottie playing in the contract year, or Dana, I'm sorry, Dana playing in the contract year is, you know, he's really stepped it up. I mean, look, maybe he had a little bit of extra motivation. I don't know. I hope players don't don't think that way. But, you know, probably know that they do um but he's 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 been very productive and of course chris jones is going to be chris jones he's just got he plays with a lot of pride so you know i think they've done a great job they throw a lot of stunts at you they they cross their guys the one thing that that bills fans watch for that that as a chiefs fan you hope that that the chiefs fix is carloft is still in his youth tends to get um beat to the outside and, and that's what uh what the packers were able to do they, they were able to break contain uh, and Jordan Love was able to break contain a few times and get it by himself a few extra seconds uh, for guys to get open um, by Karloftis just getting a little undisciplined in his rush and, and kind of biting on the inside and then leaving the outside open. So he's got to you know he's got to maintain his discipline and keep that contained. So other than that, I think it's, you're right. It's been a pretty solid front up front for those guys. But you know they're getting a lot of production because again, look at this linebacking core, you know, look at the, the, the maturity of the defensive backs that the, the Chiefs have. You know, Sneed's really come into his own. He's able to cover those long, tall, lanky receivers because of his size. Trent McDuffie really coming into his, air quote, sophomore year with, with a lot of uh, improvement. And so, you know, I think that's really played into the hands of, of getting more sacks is, is having guys who can actually cover, especially in the intermediate quick stuff, you know, where, where the Chiefs used to get beat a lot. They used to get beat a lot in that like six to fifteen yard range because they didn't have mature linebackers who knew how to cover, and then that put a lot of pressure on the D line to get to the ball quickly. Now, you know, they're getting a lot more coverage sacks than they've ever gotten for sure. Joe, thanks. I really appreciate it, and uh, good luck on Sunday. Yeah, great, great to catch up with you guys. It's going to be a great game. Looking forward to it.
Hey, Bills fans, get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Just download the app today and play any way you want. Plus, with live betting, you'll get updated odds on games that have already started. Best of all, you'll get paid your winnings fast. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the Buffalo Bills. Time to move along to the numbers game where Steve will be quizzed on Bills Chiefs history. Here we go. Let's go. Question <clears throat> number one, Steve. All right. Which club has more postseason victories in their history, Bills or Chiefs? Oh, let's see. Going all the way back to 1960 uh, here. All right, okay, okay, okay. The Bills have all of this. I would say, yeah, but they've had, the Chiefs have had significant, most of the Bills. I'd say Buffalo. The answer is the Chiefs, but oh. it is close. Chiefs with 20 career postseason victories. Bills with 18. Wow, okay, cool. Question number two. Which team do you think has the higher point differential in postseason history? Bills or Chiefs? Net points. Net points. I'll say I'll say Buffalo. And you would be correct, Steve. The Bills are plus 26 in career postseason point differential. Chiefs, believe it or not, are a minus 21. Minus 21 on yeah, point I, differential. Yeah, that's... I was on a team. I was. Uh, we beat the Chiefs in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. In a championship what was game, that, thirty-three to thirteen. And then we all, yeah, or something? and in that stretch in the nineties, they had a fifty-one to three game in there. They had, yeah. So it's, and you got to win more than you lose. So you got to win a couple games yeah. to get to a Super Bowl, even if you lose it, like the Bills did. And we got our heads handed to us in one of those Super Bowls by thirty-five. Yeah, but the other ones are the minus other ones one. Were, yeah, the other ones are close. So, and the but the, you know there's so many games. That's amazing the Chiefs have a negative. Isn't that amazing? I, I was surprised to see wow. that. All right, question three. Which club has a better playoff turnover margin, Bills or Chiefs? I'd say Bills. I mean, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I, the Bills are worse. I think the Chiefs have a better Better one. one. Yes. yes, you would be correct. Yes. Chiefs are only a plus one, but knowing the turnover problems in the Super Bowls, that doesn't help. Oh, my gosh. We turned it over nine times in one. Yeah. The Bills' career playoff turnover margin Minus 10. <laughs> Yeesh. We stink. Uh, question four. In Bill's history, do they have more wins or losses against their longtime AFL rival, the Chiefs, in the regular season? Do they have more wins or more losses against the Chiefs in the regular season in their history? I say losses because I don't ever – I remember, like, one, two. I, I remember like two games that ever took place in in Buffalo. One was a championship game, and the rest of them, all of ones I remember, were all in Kansas City. And it's hard. I'm, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say, more losses for more the Bills against the, Bills, the Chiefs. Yeah. You would be incorrect. Really? The Bills are 26, 21, and one. Against all the Chiefs, time, all time against wow, the Chiefs in that? the regular season. Wow. Yeah, I know there were some, there were some head knockers in Kansas City. Oh Sunday my night gosh, football. it was such a difficult place to play. It still is, but you know. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Pretty cool. Interesting uh, stuff. Bills Chiefs history there in the numbers game. We now help you with the free to play pick'em game on FanDuel.com called High Low. Each week, a player or team you pick to finish with the highest or lowest total. For the week in a number of different statistical categories like passing yards or rushing yards to earn points. The more points you earn, the bigger prize you can win. Play free for a chance at $10,000 in total prizes every Sunday. Steve, get us started with the high All right. for <clears throat> passing yards. High for passing yards. This might be a surprise, but I'm going to pick the Detroit Lions, despite my disdain for the NFC North <laughs> as a an entity. Well, they're playing, they're playing the Bears. That's in the NFC. So that's it. <laughs> Chicago's defense, 25th against the pass, 30th in third down defense. Jared Goff is going to go for more than 300 yards in this one. Lions, high for passing yards. All right, low for passing yards. I'm going to take the Seahawks. While I do think they may have some garbage yards at the end of this game, Geno Smith is sinking fast. I know he hasn't been 100%, but after a comeback year last year, I think the honeymoon's over. Seattle low for passing yards against San Francisco's top five defense. Right. High for rushing yards. It's Austin Eckler for me against the worst run defense in the National Football League, the Denver Broncos. We watched the Bills roll up almost 200 Bills against those guys. Austin Eckler is going to have a big day for the Chargers. All right, low for rushing yards. I'm going to take Jameer Gibbs. There weren't a lot of great choices this week, but 
I think he will make some plays in the passing game, but I expect David Montgomery to do most of the damage against his former team, the Bears, on the ground in this matchup. So I'll go with Gibbs, low for rushing yards. High for receiving yards, Cortland Sutton makes a lot of sense for me this week, going against the 31st-ranked pass defense of the Chargers, and Russell Wilson and Sutton can hook up for some big plays push the, and push Sutton to the top of the leaderboard. So I think he's got a chance to put right. together a big day. Low for receiving yards. This probably sounds crazy after the week he had last week, but I'm going to take Debo Samuel. Here's my logic. I think the Seahawks are going to be obsessed with him defensively after his big week last week and focus all of their attention on taking him away. Last week he had the monster game, but listen to this. He only had four targets in the whole game. He made the most of them. I just think Samuel's production slides back to the mean this week, so I'll take him low for receiving yards. Our closing figure examines the recent history between the Bills and Chiefs in the regular season. These two teams have met four times in the Sean McDermott era, excluding their two postseason meetings. Buffalo's record in those games, 3-1, and one, with all three wins coming on the road in Arrowhead. Those wins were by an average of 9.3 points per game, with the closest of that group coming last season in the 24-20 victory in Week 5. That'll do it for this edition of Bills by the Numbers. Be sure to subscribe so you know when the next episode is out for you to listen to because when you need to know about the Bills, you need to check Bills by the Numbers. Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time, everybody.